I think. Yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, so the other the other thing as well, as I got to apologize because this wasn't the talk that was meant to be being given. Um, so we had, uh, I was originally meant to be doing this with, with someone else, and then we had the train strike, right? Um, back in October or something. And, um, but we will come back and do it. Unfortunately, the guy that was meant to be doing it with me had to fly back to Greece. And because of the train strike, that's gonna cost like five grand or something stupid to like change his, change his ticket. But we'll come back and do this. This is gonna be an OWASP project next year. I've been building static analysis tools for about 10 years. And my, one of my frustrations has always been is they try and find vulnerabilities, but you can use the code to figure out all sorts of things like, you know, basically map out the architecture of the application, like, oh, this thing's connecting to Salesforce all of a sudden, or this thing's pulling from this database and it's pulling PII data. So we've been building a project which will be open source using Google's CodeQL which basically does it, maps out the code and figures out how to build architectures, reverse engineers the code and all sorts of stuff. It's pretty, it's kind of cool. So we'll do that, but unfortunately I would have made a complete bodge job of, of the talk to be blunt. So unfortunately on the backup, I like the stand-in, stand-in comedian, not stand-in comedian, or I feel like it were in this. And so it's kind of a rush talk, but, and hopefully it's interesting, but it's probably not what you were expecting, but it's um, going to talk about, I, I stuck a, um, uh, and this is this is irrelevant, but uh, the the startup things are kind of uh, uh, hopefully there's some some level of credibility in the in the startup tools crash stuff. So about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a series of things kicked in. I was in New York. We had a board meeting, and one of the VCs was telling me that you know the venture market is just fundamentally changing, right? Like you know if you go back a year ago, you know you could literally throw a piece of paper and someone would give you a hundred million dollars, right? You've seen all that. You've, everyone's seen all the things, right? There's like startup companies getting funded. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. So that was one thing. The second thing was that John Viega and I, who have started this new company, John wrote the first ever book on building skill software back in 2000. Um, and John and I went out trying to figure out what to go build. And we basically interviewed loads of CISOs. And we said like, what's your biggest problem? Like quite literally, like no preconceived ideas. What's your biggest problem? And one of the big problems they told us is they just want less tools, which we'll talk about now. It's like, I want less tools, not more. So you've got that. And then one of the board members started telling me about the amount of, of vendors that were in the space. And I sat with this guy called Ed Amoroso, who was the old CISO of AT&T, who's now running an analyst firm. And he told me there's 5,000 5, funded startups. <laughs> I was like, you're kidding, right? It's like 500. And he's like, no, 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 it's 5,000. And he went through. So when you think about those three things, and then you think about what's happening with the economy, you're basically, oh shit, like something bad's about to happen, right? So I, so I started writing about it. And what was kind of, what was really interesting was that I started getting both, like 90, I would say 95, 96% of all of the people that were practitioners were going like spot on, like nail on the head, all of this sort of stuff. And then about 4% of vendors were going like, you know, you're an idiot, right? It's like, you're terrible. And so like I, I, this phrase kind of sums it up. It's like, you know, and, and unfortunately kind of like a lot of the people that are caught in the, um, caught in the tailwinds of it, like they probably don't want to accept that it's true. Um, and it may not be, right? Like hand, hands, on, hands on whatever, it's like, this is just my opinion. So take your opinion for what it's worth. Um, but it, but what, I, what I'll do is I'll walk you through the rationale of what I think is going to happen. And the reason for doing the rationale is that at the end of it, Hopefully you can see my point of view about what's happening with AppSec tools, because they're going to fundamentally, I think they're going to fundamentally change. So the first thing was that teams want less tools, not more. And it's hardly surprising. Like I hate Gartner. I don't care for someone on the live stream. I don't like you. It's like, whatever. I, it's a racket, right? It's like an absolute racket. Like you have to pay them in order to talk about you. It, it's, it's just silly. And at one point they were kind of had relevant stuff, but like these days it's just totally irrelevant, right? Like, look, in the hype cycle, you've got S bombs and then you've got SCA down here. Like one is up and coming. The other one is like mature. DevSecOps is mature. I haven't done like I met a single person that thinks DevSecOps, they're totally mature in their role. Like it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. But the point is like, there are mass amounts of things, of tools and categories of tools that are happening. And um, part of it is explainable because we've seen mass amounts of change, right, in, in the technology that's coming up. Um, but the reality is you have loads of these things. And what that means is, is that with all of those tools, every single vendor that has to produce a tool wants to be relevant, right? Like you paid 100 grand for them. So they generate alerts and all this stuff like basically goes to you because they want you to know. Otherwise, you're not going to renew them and you're not going to pay the money back. 
And so as a result, like all of these CISOs that you go talk to, and I got my notes here, well, basically just tell you like, we're just surrounded, like I've got alert fatigue. And half of these tools, I don't even know if they're adding value, but they're constantly popping stuff up and they're telling me that all of these things have to be done. And so literally one CISO basically said to us, if someone comes along and tells me, I'm reading it off here, tells me what the vanity tools I can get rid of, I'll write you a big check and give you a kiss. That's just something. And uh, it was kind of interesting. He's not someone I want to get a kiss from, but whatever. Um, so it was kind of like universal feedback from, from the CISOs particularly. And when you think about kind of that, there's a lot of people who basically just want to shed tools. And then you've got the space of the economy. You've got all of these other things happening. It's like that's like piece number one that's, that's kicking in, that's, that's big. The second one is that there's way more vendors than the size of the market can support, right? So again, I'm sat with with Ed, Ed Amoroso in, in this, where are we? So like I said, Ed used to be the CISO of at t He's like one of the old guard CISOs that everyone respects. And he's running this firm called Tag Cyber, who are basically like a, a good analyst firm. Um, and he has a team of data scientists who do like crawl the web, like tracking all of these venture things. And he reckons there are 5,000 security startups in the world, like 5,000 funded security startups, which is absolutely and utterly nuts because it looks like that, like, which is, which is kind of crazy, right? And in fact, you can get pictures, like that's not 5,000 there. Like you can get pictures galore of, of well, it's totally non-comprehensible. And that's the point, like the market is just nuts, right? Like that, that was the AppSec thing that was blown up out of there. That doesn't include the supply chain companies that have got funded this year, of which there's like 10 a week, right? Like, honestly, it's nuts. If, you, if you're interested, there's a um, Fortune magazine have a thing called Term Sheet which is a newsletter you sign up to. And every day you get a, a, a thing of who's been funded. Almost every, like, honestly, there's a security supply chain company, like three of them a week. It's, it's freaking ridiculous. Um, so term sheet, there's another one called security funded if you're ever interested. But like the reality of, of all of that is that every single vendor is telling you this is the most important thing you've got to figure out how to go do. I mean, you guys who practitioners are all nodding your eyes and nodding your head. It's like you get bombarded by startups and marketing teams going this is the most important thing like fear uncertainty and doubt right and fear of missing out sells sell stuff so you got this mass landscape and then with that mass landscape you've got everyone screaming to for voice so you got people making stupid claims like there's one startup out there that is publishing on their website that you get a 500 percent roi if you buy their tool that's like it's a good deal right give them 100 grand get 500 grand back like who wouldn't do it but of course it's bullshit right it's like ridiculous so so that's causing a huge problem with all of the the vendors and as a result an awful lot of the CISOs are basically said we just shut down like we're just not I'm not like the marketing material that comes out as as research like you know if, you, if you've ever seen anything what's from the Ponemon Institute it's like you can pay 25 grand and they'll say whatever you want like literally like it's just ridiculous so you can't really trust a lot of the stuff that's coming out. And as a result, you've got mass amounts of noise. And so you've got all this confusion kicking in. And then you'll often see these things that talk about the market being just absolutely ginormous. Like, and there's, you know, all of this is like fluff, right? But like, there's one person that was predicting the security market to be $2 trillion. Like, that's the amount of money that it will be by, I think it's by 2030 or whatever. And it's $150 billion today. Well, it's growing at 12%. Kager is compound annual growth rate. If you go do the maths, it's like 63 years it'll take to get there. <laughs> it's going it's to be yes again. And who knows like what that is? Like the best guess is probably that it's about 150 billion. So there's million there, doesn't it? That's a mistake. Um, but we'll probably go to about 250 billion by about 2030. But AppSec's a tiny portion of it, right? And so the and the reason why a lot of them are investing is because they believe that most people haven't bought AppSec tools. Not quite convinced that's true myself. Like I don't know many companies that don't have AppSec tools, but they believe that that, and that's why they're going and sticking loads of money in. Um, so that's a big, a big thing that you basically got, you know, all of these vendors that are out there trying to chase a set of money that fundamentally is probably not there. Um, and then the, the third part of the big, the big wind kicked in, which was this, was that all of a sudden the, the markets start changing and the venture market for funding just fundamentally changed. So before COVID kicked in, everyone turned up to board meetings that had venture money and the board just said, go raise money. Because what was happening is anyone was throwing money at you, right? Like literally, and at crazy valuations. Like there are companies out there that have 
$100,000 of ARR annual re recurring revenue, and you could raise money at $50 million like that, right? It's like, like insane. It's not, it doesn't happen in the UK. I've only been back here for six months. It's completely different here. Like, honestly, if anyone wants to do a startup, do not do it here. It's, it's, it's insane. Like you're getting ripped off left, right, and center. But the money was just being thrown around like crazy. But what happened basically is everyone went out and raised all that money at very high valuations. And so they basically got a couple of years of runway. So like you, you figure out like how much cash you got to hire all the people and, and all of that stuff. And ultimately then it basically went bad because about six months ago, all the valuations started falling massively and people don't want to put money in. So all the investors are being incredibly cautious and the valuations are down. And the reason why that matters and I'll whiz through these slides. And if anyone is in Veg Capital, these are, are horribly inaccurate. And I apologize, but they're done for, so you can just explain the maths basically, but they're riddled with inaccuracies and holes. But the basic way, or the, and this, this is like, you know, there's loads of, you can go Google all of those things. So the basic fundamental problem though, that that is going to cause, because ultimately it's, it will cause a problem for the consumers of the tools is, is because the finance model of the startups is going to change who goes and works at them and what innovation is happening. So options aren't a big thing here, right? Stock options, no, not many people. Like if you're in Silicon Valley, every single person will be putting up the hand. That's all you work for. Like salary doesn't kind of like, Amazon cap the money at like 200 grand is the maximum salary you can make, but people are making a million bucks. It's all on stock. It's kind of weird. The UK doesn't value it, but in the US it does. So the way, and this is important for people of like where the talent goes. So the general way it works is that when you finance a, a company, the investors have a portion of stock. So let's say hypothetically, it's valued at 100, 100 bucks. You then have, you then create what's called common stock. So it's basically the stock that the founders and everyone else gets. It's generally valued at about 20% or something, but it just can vary massively. So again, like it's just directional. And then the US has a scheme called options. And I think there's a UK equivalent. I don't know if anyone's just in here. I don't know what it is. I don't think it's not as generous, but there is one. And so essentially the way it works is you get a valuation, you get an auditor who comes in and says, the price of the stock, it's called a 49A, the price of the stock is this, and you basically get it at a third of the price, roughly. So the way it works, you have to pay, a, again, you have to pay an auditor to give you the same result every time, but whatever. Um, and so you then make the difference. If you come to sell it, you make the difference between that. So the majority of people that are working in Silicon Valley startups don't make your money on salary. You make it on stock. Like it's, it's like, it's that simple. Like you're working basically your basic salary takes care of food and shelter and the rest of the stuff kind of goes. And so when you first start a company, you basically, the founder issues 10 million shares or whatever, but it's ultimately worth nothing, right? Like, 20 bucks or whatever. And, and then when you go raise your, your round of money, that options pool gets created and these two classes of shares get created. And I wish you this, it's not super important, but the problem, the, like if you go and then theoretically do this, each time it gets a smaller and smaller amount, right? So ultimately like the theory is you get a small slice of a big pie when you grow it. Um, and so that's why no one, someone said to me like, when are you gonna make money in your company? It's like, we'll never make money. I can just, it's not about that, it's getting acquired for a big slice of the pie, right? But fundamentally, the math works out that if you go raise money at a certain portion, the, the, the stock gets distributed. But the investors have what's called preferred shares. So they sit at the top of the pile, basically. So when the crap hits the fan and you wind up getting an acqui hired for, for 10 million, the investors do all right, but all of the founders and all of the employees get screwed. And so the effect of that and why that's important to whiz through that. And again, those maths are terribly wrong and there's all sorts of intricacies because it's like an, an incredibly hard thing. But the, the, the effect of it is this, is that startups either can't raise money um, and everyone then, including the employees, a lot of them go what's called underwater. So their options are actually worth less than even their strike price was. So all of a sudden the talent that was working for stock <laughs> no longer wants to go work for startups anymore where the innovation is happening and they just go head to, all the, to Google and all of these places. And so, you know, if you're a talented, a really good developer in Silicon Valley, making a million bucks, it's not hard. Like it's kind of ridiculous. Like graduates are getting like 180 grand in places like that now, $180,000. So all the money's there, there's no risk, right? They're not gonna run out of money. <laughs> and so all the talent is going there. 
And then the companies that are not doing very well, and you see a lot of this in the security industry, it's like, oh, we got acquired by someone. Like the reality is you didn't necessarily make loads of money. You got pulled into a bigger company and it's either called an acquihire where they hire you for the talent. Basically, you just get to carry on working with the team or it's called a tuck-in where it's a small amount of money that goes in. And tuck-ins can happen under $100, under $100 million. They, they don't need to report them to the SEC. So often when you see a, a, an acquisition that didn't have a price on it, it's less than $100 million, like by, de by definition. But some of them are like a lot, a lot less. And so what you're also then going to see is, is you'll just see much less innovation, right? Because this, the innovation startups, all the talent is going to all those big companies. And it's, it's a pretty big drain that's happening that's, that's, that's going on. So that's that. And then the... I guess we're almost running out of time. So then the, the, here's kind of where, where it comes. Like then, obviously, I don't need to tell anyone about what's happening with the economy. Um, although British people and the whole fucking energy crisis, it's like nuts. Like, honestly, British people have talked themselves down. It's just absolutely mad. Most miserable bunch of burgers, and I'm one, right? But, but it's just nuts coming back here about everything's wrong. But whatever. But like, it clearly is. Like, we've got a big, a big set of problems, right, going on. Um, and you now with a bad economy, like you've got less money, whoops, you've got less money, people are cautious. So what's happening with the CISOs is they're basically prioritizing stuff. So again, if you go talk to a CISO, they'll tell you I've got five things. And if you're not one of the five things, I'm not going to go do it. And so instead of this, like, I've got an unlimited amount of money, I'm going to go and buy one of every tool. You know, you're, you're seeing this. And generally what you, what's kind of widely accepted is, is that layoffs come first and then the economy tanks because people want to preserve the cash. So, you know, hundred. they reckon there's 120,000 people that have now been laid off in the tech industry, but this includes Azure, it includes AWS, like it's not, no one's immune to it by any sense. I mean, Meta, of course, like who would have thought a virtual world is not going to do very well, but whatever. Um, I guess you, we used the Facebook office at one point, didn't we? I probably shouldn't say that. Um, but it's, but it's, it's really happening. And like that one was from Seattle, the middle one where they're basically saying it's as bad as the 28, 2008 recession. So it's like, it's a pretty big collapse that's happening. And then to compound on top of that, like we got these two chumps right in the world, like, <laughs> I, like I, know. I mean, you know, I mean, what he's done at Twitter is obviously just absolutely not a madness, but like, it's not inspiring confidence to go work for, for high tech companies, of course. And then, you know, you've got the, the Ponzi scheme of, of, of uh, whatever his name was in the Bahamas. Um, going but you know again i think kraken last week well it laid off 1200 people which is one of the crypto exchanges i don't know about coinbase and all the others but like it's you know we've got mass so so we've got mass problems that's happening in there and so the only reason all of that stuff is important is because we're going to see an acceleration of of this mess getting cleaned up right basically so like you've got all of this craziness going on you've got all of these these different technologies happening that are that are ultimately kind of in some in many ways like individual pieces of the pie and you can't have tools for all of them so if you had to kind of like broadly segment tools one way of doing it is to say down the left hand side you've got developer and qa tools so it's generally assessment tools which a lot of people look at so the traditional SAS, static analysis das dynamic analysis stuff you know software composition analysis and loads of others right that fit into the place but it's generally testing in dev and qa and then you've got in infrastructure, you've got these things like bridge crew. So, you know, all of these, what's the other one? Accurix, the, the people that are basically scanning infrastructure as code stuff. Um, and I think HashiCorp have come out with features to actually do it now, haven't they? I, I, I forget, which is be interesting on the next slide. And then you've got things like container vulnerability scanning. So it's kind of ultimately like pre-prod, pre I guess, kind of like clean, cleaning it up. And then traditionally you've had loads of production stuff. So like APM is like app dynamics and you know Datadog, right? And these guys, um, web app firewalls, of course, like sit in that, like basically monitoring application production. And then you've got all the infrastructure stuff. So, you know, cloud security posture management. So it's like the old school was Palo Alto, the new school is Wiz. You've got, you know, data security platforms coming out. You've got workload protection. So the orcas of the world and all of that stuff, Twistlock and, and all of that stuff. And so kind of it was segmented, right? Like the first one, you had individual tools in each of those. So if you wind back like 15 years, like DAST was Spy Dynamics, IBM AppScan, I'm sure my age, right? But like all tools, which no one's probably heard of, but, but whatever. Yeah, there you go. Two old blokes, you know, I'm about them, right? Um, 
but like that was that was kind of what it was. Like the first generation of SaaS tools was Fortify and Coverity, standalone tools for doing individual things. These days, it's typically like you buy Vericode, you buy you know Synopsys or one of those things. And I guess in some ways we're seeing the second generation of like SamGraph and CoQL come through, but it was individual things. And then these companies like Synopsys and and Vericode came through and built a, a suite of them. You're now what you're now seeing happening in real time is the top guys are basically acquiring some of the things from the bottom. So for example, I'm sorry, the bottom guys are basically acquiring some of the things from the top. So like you've got now Palo Alto have bought Bridge Crew. So they're now moving into infrastructure. Sneak bought a cloud security posture management company called Fug. So they're trying to now compete with both cloud and application security. And so the fundamental kind of shift that's happening is like you're now seeing platforms emerge that are basically cloud native platforms of AppSec and CloudSec because it's cloud, it's cloud native. And generally like that is gonna have a pretty massive impact because I don't know anyone that's ever said they love Palo Alto products. I don't know, maybe I'm, there's probably a few people in the room maybe. Is anyone from Palo Alto here? I don't know, well, don't stick your hand up. Don't stick your hand up. It's, you know, and it used to be like when I sold SourceClear to Verica, which is part of CA, it's like the joke was that's where software goes to die. And it's kind of true, like, like stuff doesn't get innovated. And it's, and so you're going to wind up with these mega platforms that are loads and loads of little tools that have been built in. They're not very good at integrating them. They've got massive sales teams. And what they do is they create, put you on a big, long enterprise license. So you can never get off the, off the gravy train. And so we're going to see a mass problem of that. But what you're also seeing is you're seeing you're going to see the cloud guys move into AppSec. So that's what's happening already with Palo Alto. And I suspect you're going to see it with, with companies like Wiz and other people as well. And you're certainly seeing Datadog, who have been up in the top right-hand corner, and now start moving into other areas, CSPM and everything. So ultimately, we're going to have these, these mass platforms. And what that's going to likely mean for security tools is two things. It's going to be really hard to build an individual tool to compete with these guys. And that's not because what you're also seeing, and we heard from all the CISOs, is they said, we're no longer necessarily buying best in class. We want something that's good enough from a single vendor. And because they can massively discount them, in some ways, they'll basically shut off innovation happening. And people are just going to buy a single, a single tool with a single pane. Because when they have that happens, then they don't have to deal with 10 alerts from 10 different companies, 10 reporting systems from 10 different companies. They have to normalize all the vulnerabilities because everyone calls them different things and all of that sort of crazy crap that's going on. So, so that is what I think fundamentally is happening. Again, it's just my opinion. Excuse me. The good news is that... Um, what is likely to happen out of this is that there's going to be two, and I'm just looking through my notes here. There's going to be two fundamental kind of like, I think I've got one more slide. Hold on. No. So fundamentally, the, the, the ultimate winners are, are unlikely to be the, the, those platform plays. It's likely to be Microsoft and AWS. Microsoft bought GitHub. They bought NPM. Like they have the dev tools. They have the cloud tools. It's like if you have a feature out of that that you pretty much get for free, <laughs> it's pretty damn hard to go justify having something else. So, you know, they have cloud security, like you have, what is it in, it's like guard duty, isn't it, in, in AWS? And then you've got, you know, all the Azure things. And so the, the ultimate winners are likely to be those, those people where basically it just becomes a feature. And if you think about GitHub, like Dependabot is nowhere near anything that we built at SourceClear, but most people are now using it because it's free. It's like, you just wind up and flip the bit on. And so that same thing is going to happen at two levels. One, it's going to happen at, the, at that, that level, and then the other one, it will happen at the infrastructure level. So I think there'll be two consolidations. The first one is the Palo Altos and all of the Synopsys and all those guys will compete. And then the second one is GitHub and AWS will wipe them out of the water. But just my predictions, I don't know. So anyway, that's, that's that, and I've run over. So. so I'm sorry, that probably wasn't the talk you came for, was it? <laughs> it wasn't how to do cross-site scripting or anything like that. But. So there you go. That was brilliant. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, right. Can I ask the first question? No, don't take your mic oh, off. Sorry. I have a question. So just two days ago, Google launched a uh, free SEA platform called OSV. <laughs> well, OSV is a vulnerability database, right? Uh, not only. There's a scanning tool with it. Yeah. Well, so... Um, 
I know you mentioned, of course, Google, Microsoft. So on, on this big scale, do you think it's um, going to be concentrated again back in the Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, going on everything? Is look, there a I, space for anyone? Look, when I ran MSDN, I had a business unit that had a billion dollars of revenue, and I had a million subscribers. The billion dollars of revenue didn't mean anything at Microsoft. It was a seeding program, because if people don't get developer tools, they don't build on the Windows ecosystem. So Google, AWS, and Azure know that if they don't have all those things to support proper development, I mean, ultimately, they built Android to stop being locked out of the, the advertising market, right? Like, it's a completely different scale. So Google, so the guy who supports that is a guy called Eric Brewer at Google, who's absolutely fantastic. And, and then I have a bit of a, I guess, a conflict is that Phil Vanables, who's the CISO of Google Cloud, was on my board at my last company. So I have a bit of a bias, I guess, like, to be transparent. But, like... What those guys are doing is absolutely phenomenal. OS, basically, CVE is broken, so they went and built their own as OSV, osv.dev. And osv.dev is a distributed database with custom schemas that you can go distribute vulnerabilities around. They're verifying things. They put all the money behind OSSF, Open Source Security Foundation. So they basically funded Alpha Omega to literally go out and find open source that's, that's broken and fixed. Like, yeah, it's awesome, right? They just don't have, I mean... GCP only has a 9% market share. AWS and Azure have the majority. But if you look at all the, all the tooling in, in those places, like for sure. I don't know, my take. Do you think that uh, Microsoft will start charging a lower fee for GERB advanced security to basically kill off competition? I don't know. It's Baz from Mike from GitHub's not here. Is he? I don't know. I, I I don't know. I mean, look, the I mean they're investing heavily. Like when they bought Semel, which was here, they bought Dependabot. I know that they're trying to put other features into it. Um, I think that the reality is I don't I don't know is the honest answer. But I, my suspicion is like again, the more features you have in higher level tiers, the more sticky you become. And if you look at some of those companies, like the, the Veracodes and the Synopsis of the world, they have pretty large services teams, but it's not because they want to make money off of services because they want to wire into the business process so you never get off it. And if you are baked into a PR process and everything else in GitHub, like you're unlikely to get off it. So my suspicion is they don't need to make money off of it. It doesn't matter. I mean, at that scale, like that level of money is trivial, right? When I ran MSDN, I used to have a $30 million advertising business, right? Because when you download Windows 7, like, you know what, you can charge anyone whatever money to advertise against Windows 7. I was told, get rid of it because it's an accounting error, right? But like, how many startups would die to have $30 million of revenue? Like, loads of them, right? So it's just, so for these guys, it's a strategic play. It's not a, just at a different scale, right? Any more questions in the audience? Cool. I can take this silly thing off now, can I? Oh, sure. no, Hi, very nice presentation, by the way. Uh, I wanted to ask, you know, the uh, general enterprise levels, do you think the uh, companies are, like those are more or less now started to wake up of uh, security issues? Because before it wasn't that much uh, prevalent? No, can you repeat, can you like repeat the question? I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can follow. Can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. No, what I'm saying that uh, I was actually saying that, you know, if you look in terms of either enterprise or medium sized businesses, mm -hmm. yes, do you think do you think now that they've come up and woken up to the smell of coffee, basically, of security issues? Like, uh, like they weren't really that much interested, maybe in next in the past five years. Uh, late, I mean, in the past, I mean, sorry. I, I mean, I think people have been super. I think they've been super in, totally engaged for the last 20 years, right? I don't, I don't think, my personal take, I think it's, I don't know. I mean, you hear at ThoughtWorks, a company that builds online banking and they're happy to do things like this, right? Like Facebook, Amazon, all of those. So I don't, I don't know. I, did, I, I think most people are already engaged. I think, I think the problem is, of course, is that you can't hire enough people. The landscape's changing constantly. Like keeping ahead of it is just a big problem, right? But I don't think they don't care. My, my take, I don't know. Anyone, no one's going to admit to saying they don't care about security in the room here. No, but uh, are the tools the silver bullet then? 
Right. So no, so, of course so not. That's, that's the thing, because my, my question really is, I want to ask, obviously, you, you, you had your magic quadrant there. but that's Not my magic thing. quadrant, just to well, be clear. Yeah, quadrant there. <laughs> I um, could create one for you one, on the fly. One, it's probably just as one very important but... tool I think was missing, and I think not every, people are not talking about this, and that is developer education, secure coding education. There are companies there as well. I don't, I didn't spot a, a single name in your slides. Well, so my, you... my my personal take, which is, and this is not an OWASP take, but my personal take is developers don't care about security. I've been I've been driving the thing up hell for twenty years, and I kind of like gave, gave up, and it's. They'll do the right thing if you make it easy enough for them, but ultimately they're dealing with building features, shipping features, dealing with maintainability of code, dealing with performance and dealing with all these other things. So fundamentally, like my personal take is you have to basically build frameworks and tooling that takes the problem away from them. And if you do that, like what we learned at SourceClear around SCA was that the only time you get developer adoption is when they actually auto updated libraries for them. And then the side effect was getting rid of vulnerable libraries, but they didn't care about getting rid of vulnerable libraries. So I'm not convinced. I think the awareness of the problem is really important, but educating them, I'm not 100% convinced it's as important personally. I know that's not the normal take of most people, but it's just my, I'm just an old gear who doesn't care, basically. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Mark.